let's let's just jump into it. I mean, you you made a documentary about uh, whether women have a higher sex drive than men. Dog, oh my God, I'm sorry about this dog. All of no that problem. ripping noise that you heard was was all her, as well. Um, but uh, so uh, and and a lot of the information in it is stuff that I have already you know I've come across uh, in my travels, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, Meredith uh, Chivers, I believe, or Chivers, um, her her research on uh, women's responsiveness, uh, the the research on how women um, get turned on even by watching animals going at it, you know, things like that. Um, dog, shush. And um, so essentially, um, it's, it's all stuff, a lot of it is stuff that I've sort of come across before. Um, some of it I feel is more valid than, than others, but, you know, in terms of uh, just the way it's been presented um, by researchers. But uh, I, I'm curious to know what you left out. What was too controversial to put into this documentary, right? Like, that's really what I'm curious about, so. Curious about, so. Okay. Um, do, do you want to jump into that, or do you want to know the backstory why I created the documentary in the first place? I want to know that first, and then we'll okay. get into, yeah. Okay. So, uh, what it is, is I actually never planned on making this documentary. Um, what it is, is I had uh, three female interns and they were uh, working at my company. And then one day um, we were having a discussion about sexuality. And then eventually um, it morphed into um, sex drive. And um, they really surprised me when all three of them said that women had a higher sex drive. And at first I thought they were crazy, but they were like really adamant about it. And then I got thinking because these three women, they were different, like totally different from each other. Like they weren't um, similar. And then when they started giving their reasons, um, I, I was very intrigued. And I was actually so intrigued that I was like, hey, maybe we should make a documentary about this. And that's really how the documentary uh, got started. And one of the things um, that I learned in making this documentary is indeed um, getting to know how women think and how much that differs uh, from men. Because even though indeed um, uh, the MRAs and, and, and the MGTOWs and the pickup artists um, do talk about uh, um, women, um, they, they, um, they, they, they talk about it each in their own category. And um, for me, it was very interesting to see um, how they are sexually and how that differs. And one of the things that I noticed is that women, even though, you know, men and women live in the same world, um, for women, their world is way more complex, as in um, they have to satisfy three people. One is their family, like their mom uh, and their dad. Uh, two are their, uh, their their friends, usually their female friends. And three is the, the mainstream media who says uh, three conflicting things. So the family is like, okay, try and be a virgin, be the best girl you possibly can, stay daddy's girl forever, preferably. Then you have the mainstream media who says the opposite. Go do whatever you want, you know, have as much sex, be like the guys, it's all going to be fine. And then you have the girlfriends who are like, well, if you sleep around, we'll gossip about you. So right. for a woman, it's really difficult to navigate this. And what they try to do is they try to please everyone, but you can't please, uh, you can't please a a everyone at the same time. It's impossible. And this is one thing that guys don't understand, though. Slowly in the last couple of years, um, guys, I think, are starting to get it because they're being exposed to the same thing where it's like their family and their friends are like, go get laid. And the media is like, no, um, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Um, male privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be rapey. Yeah, Stop. yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so on. So it's like for the guys, it's like, should I engage? Should I not engage? And that's a thing that women have been dealing with for hundreds uh, or maybe even thousands of years. 
Um, so that's one thing that I found really interesting in, in understanding um, uh, the female mindset. But one of the darkest things that I discovered um, in this documentary, and I couldn't really put uh, or at least highlight it, but I do explore the, the, the undertone. So it's a thin red line through the entire thing, and at the end it gets a little bit darker. But uh, one of the things that I noticed that I couldn't put in there was that um, men and women are becoming less compatible. Um, and, and I don't say this uh, lightly, and, and that's the thing that I didn't highlight or feature um, in this documentary. It's the thing that I left out. And it's, it's actually, um, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll first start out with the incompatibility and, and then um, uh, talk about uh, um, the other stuff. Uh, the thing that I noticed that that, um, that is happening is that uh, we are going back to a um, polygamous or po polyamorous society, the way it's always been. And the problem with that, which most people don't realize, it's that a few men at the top get most of the women and the majority of the men are screwed. And this actually then means that I can say there is no win-win situation because on the one hand, women, you know, they want to get married as well. Um, so it's, 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 it's a little bit, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, um, very tricky. Um, um, let's see, how can I, um, okay. So, so, for example, um, you know, the, the, the uh, divorce rate um, and yeah. like 70 percent is initiated uh, by women. Um, th there is a lot behind that. And um, also with the increasing, um, uh, let's see, with, with the increasing uh, access to education, women, they don't date down. So what's happening is that women are rising and in them rising and if men aren't rising with them and they aren't rising with them, um, basically less and less men are becoming uh, um, uh, attractive. Dating, dating material. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. And, and this is a, uh, is a serious problem. It's in making it, like I realized we were heading towards a gender war. It, 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 it's like it, it's that bad. But then after I finished, I was like, it's like we're not heading towards a gender war. We are actually in a gender war. And indeed, what I mean with a gender war for the people who aren't familiar um, is not that men and women are stabbing each other in the streets. It's actually isolation. It's, you know, men being alone and bitter, women being alone and bitter, and being very angry at each other. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, indeed. And th 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 those are some of the things, indeed, that you also cover um, in your thing. And what I see is I see things are getting way, uh, way worse, where it's like, for example, um, let's see, I think it was, uh, let me see if I can bring that up. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Washington Post recently, um, um, or not recently, I think it was now a couple of months ago, uh, right. uh, posted an article, Why I Can't Hate Men, which uh, basically advocates the uh, advocates for the abolishment of men to vote. And I mean all men, not just white men. Um, so it's like we're basically there where the mainstream media is endorsing these ludicrous ideas. And if you look at it objectively, especially me as a black person, the only people publicly who are opposed to me having the vote are radical feminists. Yes. So it's 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 people need to realize and, and, and wake up what is going on because um, the left right now or the radical left right now is currently way more dangerous than the radical right. And it's uh, the problem with that is uh, that the radical left is feeding the radical right. It's making the radical right grow. And then the worst part is that every time the radical right grows and they make these giant leaps and bounds, the radical left turns around and it's like, how did this happen? But I know. 
Yeah, indeed. It's really uh, stuff like that. And also, you know, on the right, um, um, I also see these, 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 these videos where on the opposite end, for example, you have Black Pigeon who advocates to take away the rights of women. I'm like, really? Are you crazy? And I looked at the likes and dislikes of, uh, of the video and I was like, majority were likes. And, and um, it had, I think, uh, I think it was like 1.4 million views. So these things are not fringe ideas anymore. Um, things are really uh, escalating and are getting bad. And recently, I think it was um, maybe even a couple of weeks ago um, that Hungary uh, banned gender studies in the entire country. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Oh, yeah. 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 So, so it's like things really are ramping up. And the most dangerous thing uh, th th that I've learned is that one of the reasons why women are continuing this gender war is that they think that they're winning. The, uh, and, 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 and that's the most dangerous part because what it is is the hatred inside men is slowly building up. And, you know, it, it doesn't show instantly because, you know, men, you know, we're taught to keep our emotions down. But every single day I see um, that men are getting less tolerant of women where um, – um, I don't know if you've also watched this video where um, I think it was, uh, let me see, what was the guy again? Um, da, 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 um, that that, 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 that famous that. British guy, uh, uh, he's also a YouTuber. Um, you, uh, you, look, you look for, is it Milo Yiannopoulos? No, no, it's, it's the other one, the, 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 the kind of fat one with the beard. Um, oh, Sargon of Akkad? Yeah, yeah, Sargon of Akkad. Okay, you look for that or just hold that thought for one second. And I have to deal with this goddamn dog, okay. um, yeah. and uh, and I'll, I'll just be right back. I will I will edit this this no, little no interlude out during the final thing. So just give me a second. Okay. Um, yeah. So Sargon of Akkad um, a while ago made a video, and, and uh, there was like a a, a small uh, what is it conference hall. And in it, um, he, um, he uh, talked about a tweet that he sent to a British PM, um, which said, I wouldn't even rape you. And right. then the uh, almost the entire whole, or at least on Sargon's side fans, they, they, they started laughing. And um, the, 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 the cringeworthy thing is that the PM actually was sexually assaulted in a bar um, in the past where a man you know, put her hand down, down her skirt. So she was actually a, a, a victim of sexual assault. And what I see happening is that these men who laughed are not your traditional misogynists. It's more reactionary. They've been so desensitized by all of the the, the negative press uh, that that men receive, and you know, almost everything is rape culture and so on and right. so forth. That 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 for them, they don't they don't care anymore, or they care way less than they used to. And this is something that like like people really need to wake up where where. Like, I'm really like advocating to people like, get involved. Things are getting very, uh, uh very bad. And, and that's, you know, why I'm, I'm happy that, you know, you're doing indeed, uh, uh, w w what you're doing. Um, for me, um, um, I, I was a little bit aware of the, 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 the MRAs and, and the men's issues, uh, when I made, uh, my first documentary, Are All Men Pedophiles? Uh, when um, uh, a well, part of it, that was yours, right? right? Yeah, yeah. When when a part of it uh, of my documentary looked at the pedophilia hysteria and how the distance between men and children became larger, and now what I'm seeing is that the distance between men and women are becoming larger. So all three of us, men, women, and children, are becoming way more isolated. And, and that really is, is a deep, worrisome uh, uh, thing. And um, um, I, I, I talked to, um, um, to, a, um, to a sex worker recently, um, and she uh, primarily works with 
with guys who are afraid of intimacy um, and who haven't had sex in the first time, a.k.a. incels. And um, that was a very interesting talk because now, indeed, the media is becoming more aware of the incels. And even though the radical incels are the ones who get the most attention because they're the ones who are posting the hateful posts and stuff like that. They are the tip of the iceberg. The incels are steadily uh, growing. And one of the things that I discuss in my uh, new documentary is I look at the link between uh, violence um, and polygamy, because one of the things that most people don't realize, especially um, the, 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 the newer ones, I think maybe that the conservatives in the back of the head, they kind of know. But what it is, is when the, the, the system of marriage is broken, so one man, one woman, the woman, they tend to go after the top and then forget the rest. And then that makes the rest, they, they, the guys, yeah, indeed, re <laughs> resentful and, and angry. And, um, I see that women, they don't understand this because their whole life they have had access to, to sex. Sex for them, you know, it is something that is easy, easy. peasy. Yeah, indeed. Super so, easy to get. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I try to tell women is I give them this example to kind of like visualize what an incel goes through. Uh, incel kind of has the same desperate mindset as a woman who is past 35, single, and hasn't found a guy. Then, you know, it's like no more fun and games. You know, everybody's yeah. looking at you. Your family is looking weird at you. Your uh, friends are looking weird at you. Society is like, you know, what's wrong with you? Your, that is, and your hormones are saying you need yeah, to get Yeah, and your body is done. saying, I have to have a baby. Yeah, Indeed. ASAP. And, yeah, and, and that's, that's the same stressful mindset that incels go through from the very start. And for them, as the years go by, also, it gets worse because, you know, a lot of it has to do with self-confidence. And um, I know that, like, girls, they talk so easily, like, well, you know, just go out there and, and, and talk and be yourself. But Put yourself it, out there. Yeah, and, indeed. Yeah, you'll find someone. Yeah, no. But, but it, it, it doesn't work like that. And one of the things uh, that, that, that the sex worker said is, yeah, um, guys have to be more than average in order to be attracted to girls. Uh, then the question is, how do you do that? How do you become more than average? Because the average person is average. That's the literal definition of average. So basically yeah. what women are saying is, don't be yourself and you'll be fine. Yeah, that no, and work. on top of that, on top of that, you're looking at, you know, uh, the situation that you were discussing before where, uh, you know, women are really only interested in the top 20% when it's a sexual free-for-all. It's a complete free market economy in terms of sex. Um, and so essentially what you have is OkCupid okay running some numbers <laughs> and um, they find that the bell curve when men on the on the website uh, judge women on the website for attractiveness. It's like a normal bell curve, right? It's like it looks perfectly normal, right? But when women judge men, they deem 80 percent of men to be below average. Right. So how it's not even how do you become above average? It's how do you get into that top 20 percent? Because those are the only ones that women consider to be above average, which is about unrealistic expectations, in in my opinion. And it's about the fact that uh, women are no longer stigmatized for having sex outside of marriage. And so they are prioritizing different things. Um and I'm really uh, understanding why you didn't include this stuff in your documentary, because, um, you know, when you have people like Elliot Roger and Alec Manassian out there um, going on rampages because they can't get laid, um, you know, because they're in cells, because they're in that bottom 80 percent of men um, that, you know, and they resent it. Uh, what you what you do is you attach yourself to, um, I guess, maybe a situation where you're easily portrayed as making excuses for those men and what they did. And, and that's not necessarily how things work. You know, like when Jordan Peterson talks about, and you know who Jordan Peterson is. Yeah. I'm, yeah. When he talks about how income inequality 
actually, and relative inequality. So it's not about, you know, being poor. It's about being poor relative to um, a group that is insanely rich, right? So if the insanely rich didn't exist, the poor would feel like they were just fine, right? It's all about in relative terms. But when, you, when you're talking about inequality as, as a driver of violence within societies, um, you know, something that actually causes societies to destabilize uh, and causes, uh, is, is a causal factor in terms of, of violence among the, I guess, the people who have stacked up at the bottom. Um, nobody really says, well, those poor people just have this horrible sense of entitlement to other people's money, right? You know, even the people on the right wing say, yeah, it, it's it's horrible that there are poor people and you know we should be doing something about that and here's here's how you can you know as a poor person maybe improve your situation and and you know take your piece of the american dream or whatever right um and and we'd like to help you do that right uh, the 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 difference in opinion between the left and the right is how do you help the poor it's not it's not about um Helping the poor versus refusing to help the poor. It's about how do you help the poor. Um, but when you talk about this, the exact same thing, only in terms of the sexual marketplace, right, then all of a sudden these incels feel entitled to sex. And nice guys, trademark, right, feel entitled to sex and entitled to women's bodies and all of this stuff. They feel entitled. They're, they're being portrayed essentially – um, like, you know, that scene in Oliver Twist, right? You know, where he goes up to the front of the orphan's home and he says, please, sir, can I have some more thin mm -hmm. gruel, right? And all of the people in charge of the orphan's home are outraged that he would feel so entitled as to ask for more than what they gave him. Um, it seems to me that feminists are taking the position of those people who just are not capable of understanding that you can feel capable of being hungry without feeling entitled to steal food from someone or feel entitled to somebody else's food. It's not a sense of entitlement. It's being hungry, right? It's yeah. not a sense of entitlement to complain about being poor. It's, it's being poor. Right. It's not a sense of entitlement to complain about no matter what I do, how many jobs I work, minimum wage jobs I work. I can't get ahead. I can't, you know, uh, maintain financial stability. I can't I can't be secure in my in my housing. I can't I can't have any of those things, even though I'm working, you know. Multiple minimum wage jobs. Um you know, and nobody says to them, well, you're just entitled and people probably shouldn't hire you or trust you to work for them because you're probably going to be a, you're probably a thief who feels entitled to other people's property. You know, like you don't you don't see that backlash from the people on the left to those kinds of problems, but they don't want to look at sexual inequality, I guess, or inequality of sexual access um, to be. A similar problem with similar negative fallout and I'm sorry but there's going to be similar fallout and I don't want to live in a society where 20% of the men sire 95% of the babies that's chimpanzee society and, you and, know and, and, and that's how it actually was um, uh, historically, it's, it's historically that 40 percent, roughly 40 percent um, of uh, of the men um, reproduced and this uh, majority, 60 percent um, did not even get a chance of reproduction. So it's actually we're going back. So uh, the more freedom women have, it, it, it's, it's a double edged sword, because on the one hand, it means, OK, a wider partner choice. But on the other hand, it means limited marital options and indeed like women like really like need to realize that be because things are going um, um, so bad it's that the majority of the women are left with basically 
um, four options if, if they can't uh, find a man. Uh, one is, for example, um, to, um, um, to 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 marry down, and then the guy has no idea what what's coming. You know what I mean? Like even on the wedding day, like in her mind, she'll be like, "I'm better than this guy." And then what happens is eventually, because you know, um, woman the hypergamy. Um, yeah, but, but but like even even if you put uh, the, the the hypergamy aside, women first they want to have the baby, you know, like you know, like they can't find a man, and then they get desperate, so then they marry. Then after the baby. It rages out of the system. Then they look around and they wake up and like, okay, what am I doing with this guy? And then that ends up in divorce. And then um, you actually have two problems. One, you have a divorce. And two, you have um, um, a, a child being raised by a single parent. And this is something that is really underestimated, like how bad uh, that is because we're really entering the age of, of single parenthood academic. And I think recently, I think it was like uh, maybe a year ago or maybe even two years ago that the majority of children living um, in America that, that are alive today um, are raised by only one parent uh, uh, in, in the household. So mm -hmm. already as, 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 uh, as a single parent, you already are the majority in America and and the consequences for that are huge because for example um like if i give my own example it's um my mother died at birth and i never knew my father and you know so my biological father was never in my life and luckily i was adopted but what it is is like as far <laughs> as my biological father is concerned i have absolutely no love for him for the, like even stronger like i like well like i almost hate the guy you know what i mean so yeah. what it is is that um children that, that that are being raised by by single parents they in most cases have a feeling of hatred um or rage guided at least towards one parent either it's the parent who is not in their life or it's it's the parent um, who, uh, who 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 is raising them, and then that they fantasize that the other parent would probably be better, and so on and so forth. So it's it's really well, this is, a. Hmm? This is why this is why you see that uh, like there was a brilliant presentation by um, Bettina Arndt and Kay Heimowitz in Australia about at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, I believe about kids raised by single uh, parents and all of the problems that, that they tend to suffer in terms of just negative outcomes and being at a uh, higher risk of, of those outcomes. And somebody asked, you know, is, it, is this something that applies to children whose fathers died? And the answer was not that we can see. Um, instances where uh, children lost their fathers to death don't seem to suffer these same outcomes. And I think it's because they don't feel that they grow up not feeling like there's a parent who abandoned them when they had a choice to stay or a di the parent who's their parent pushing the other parent out. Right. So they don't feel they feel cheated, but they don't feel cheated by either of their parents of the opportunity of having that two parent situation. And so I think that that really gives them a buffer um, and it doesn't lead to those feelings of resentment. You might resent death or, you know, the military or, you know, the war in Iraq or whatever it was, cancer, whatever it was that took your dad away. Um, you might resent that, but you don't resent your mom. Uh, for pushing him out of your life, and you don't resent your dad for walking out of your life, because um, neither of them had a choice in that. And so I think that essentially you, what you're saying is absolutely true. It does lead to so many feelings of resentment against one parent or the other or both, for sure. And and then th there's also the generational aspect where children, they grow up learning, they watch their parents, and they try to imitate their parents. So if there's only one parent or there is divorce, 
then it's also more likely that the children themselves will have trust issues because like if my mom doesn't trust men, why should I trust men? You know what I mean? True. So it's 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 really all of this like it it, it it's like a, a a giant snowball that keeps on growing larger. And the thing is like in this whole complex uh, uh, um, thing, everyone is affected. So even for example, the men, the men at the top, the top 20%, like you have the Me Too movement. Um, right. And um, I don't know if you know the book um, of Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich. Do you, do you um, know that? Book? No, no. Okay, it, 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 it's fascinating. What he did was um, he interviewed um, a lot of very uh, highly successful people, and he discovered that. Uh, very successful people um, had have a very high sexual nature, but the key to their success is that they are able to redirect that energy into work. So going after the Me, Me Too movement and all of those guys who have a high sex drive, it's like we're shooting society in the foot because it's those guys that pro propel us forward. There's this misconception that the majority of the people um, make the world a better place. It's usually individuals that create something that other people can copy or bring something into the world uh, that is new. It's really that the in, in, individuals, highly productive individuals, are the right. ones that have pushed us um, to greatness and to where we are now. So it's 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 like we're really like like okay, where is the whole Me Too movement going? And one of the things that I found so interesting um, about the Me Too movement is that, in my opinion, it lasted too long. As in, like I would have I would have expected it to die out a long time ago. And that really got me thinking because at first I thought, okay, this is like a genuine movement, it's organic and so on. But as the media kept on going and going and going, I was like, I think all of them or maybe almost all of the media owners like uh, like uh, Rupert Murdoch and so on and so forth, uh, they're all men. So why in the world would they continue a movement that would eventually get to them. Like, I'm thinking that there has to be something behind that. I don't know if you have any theories oh, on that's, that. Oh, that's about, that's all about throwing other men under the bus, right? Because, um, and you, you, like, this is, this is not the way women, like, women don't behave quite like this. Men tend to um, behave like this in the sense of, um, even if this Me Too movement devours 80% of men, that's just more poontang for me. And it's not, it's not a conscious process of thought. It's just how men relate to each other because of the differences in the reproductive model. So it's just their personalities, their temperaments, the way they relate to each other, the way they don't relate to each other. Um, I've said before that if men had a, a, evolved bias uh, to toward each other, right, and against women. So to um, circle the wagons around men against uh, attacks by women, which they obviously don't, right? But if they had anything like that, it would have been bred out of them long ago because you can't spend 100,000 years of evolutionary history or more bashing other men over the head to death right, to protect women and children, um, you, you can't do that if you feel a bias towards other men that is similar to the bias you feel towards women and children, or at least your women and children. So, and you even look at chimpanzee societies, right? They go to war against each other. What do they do? What do they do? Two troops come together. Uh, one of them kills all of the males in the other one, and then they, they bring the females into their troop and and absorb them into their group right that's how that works right and it's it's not pretty and it's not because you know oh yeah there's something intrinsic about those female chimpanzees that makes the male chimpanzees see them as valuable you know in some kind of pretty uh you know philosophical uh, wonderful abstract way no it's about uteruses okay um 
but that that's essentially how it works, right? You know, if if you eliminate the other males in the area, then you get all of the female approval for yourself, which is why you see, oh, God, I once compared, there was a photo of uh, Barack Obama signing the Lilly Ledbetter Act, right? And so he's sitting just with this smug grin, right, signing this piece of paper. It's a useless piece of legislation. Um, and it uh, doesn't do anything that the Equal Pay Act of 1963 doesn't already do, except it just expands the statute of limitations so that people can sue over stuff from 20 years ago. That's all it really did. did. And um, so he's there, and he's surrounded by all of these women, and they're all just gazing down at him adoringly, and he's kind of just looking smug. And I compared it with a picture of a sea lion, a male sea lion, with his head back, and he's just basking in the sun, and he's surrounded by his harem of females, and they're all gazing adoringly up at him, right? And they both had the same expression on their face, and it was it isn't even necessarily that Obama wants to get laid by any of these women. He just really feels great when he has all of these women smiling down on him, and Men, particularly men in positions of power, are perfectly happy to cut other men out of the game in order to get that approval. And so I think that that's really what's going on there. I think that that's, that's really what's going on behind this sort of um, immediate vilification of men who can't get laid. Uh, you know, that comes not just from feminists. It comes from traditionalists. It comes from men and women, Right. If you can't manage to get yourself a partner, you're you're just garbage. You're just garbage. And so get out of our sight. Don't complain. We don't want to hear it. And uh, and just go away. So essentially, I think that, you know, like there's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of um, psychological things going on here that are contributing to the problem. And we ignore them at our peril. We really do. Um, so, yeah. Like one of the things, though, like I do agree with your theory, but I also think there's actually something more insidious behind it, because, I mean, if we are looking at really the, the top people who own the media companies, like their main job is to manipulate people. It's either into buying products or or mm -hmm. uh, uh, starting wars and so on. So these are highly intelligent people. And like if they see danger coming like I think that they would at least try to avoid it because like, one of the things that really makes me suspicious about the Me Too movement is that um, um, in, during the civil rights movement, the black civil rights movement in America, uh, one of the things that the government did, and, and um, this has been documented, um, in order to break up uh, the black civil rights movement, uh, they tried feminism. They, they, they tried to create a wedge between the black females and the black males. And mm -hmm. this indeed was, was a strategy uh, that was implemented. And it makes me think, like, could they be doing the same thing here? Because um, right now in the media, it's, it's all, you know, about going back and forth between men and, 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 and gender wars. And, like, real issues get ignored. Like, for example, when... Um, uh, when that law uh, uh, passed about net neutrality, it's mm -hmm. like the, the left and right were perfectly played uh, through against each other or, or the Monsanto Bayern merger. Most people don't know about that. So it's like. I don't know, like maybe they, they, they could also be using the, the divide and conquer strategy yes. in order, because if we fight amongst one another, we mm -hmm. don't fight them. If we fight amongst each other, we stay poor, we stay low, and they, they stay high. Yeah, no, I agree, and this is why I am a big, huge fan of uh, Mary Harris Jones, um, Mother Jones from, you know, sort of the uh, – early uh, stages of the union movement, um, the workers' union movement oh, in, yeah, yeah. in the U.S. Um, I hate what the magazine that is named after her, Mother Jones, um, has become because it's, it's bought into identity politics and it's largely ignoring um, the struggles of the working class. And I have to say, um, you know, like 
capitalism is the best system. I'm sorry, but capitalism is the best system. The reason why capitalism is the best system is because it depends on human vices in order to work rather than on human virtues. And I don't think that we can depend on human virtues for a system to work. Um, so it relies on people uh, being greedy. It relies on, on, you know, all of those things. Um, and, uh, and it works dis well, it, it works because of those things, uh, not despite them or not uh, requiring those things to be eliminated or erased. Right. Um, but at the same time, I'm I'm a fan of a mixed economy. Um, you know, I, I don't disagree with uh, taxation. I, I don't disagree with the fact that, you know, if if you are going to use roads, uh, you should be paying for them and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, so I'm not an anarcho-capitalist by any stretch of the imagination. But when you look at um, when you actually look at Mary Harris Jones and what she did, um, she, she said, uh, women's suffrage is bullshit. She said, you don't need the vote to raise hell as a woman. She was, uh, named the most dangerous woman in America while she was active. Um, and she advocated for minors and workers' rights, um, as an extension of the rights of all working class people, right, including women and children. And she involved women and children in all of her activism. So it was it was essentially a bringing. She did not describe marriage as a, an oppressive condition for women. Right. She, she was not Marxist. The Marxists described marriage, the, the institution of marriage as an oppressive condition for women that facilitates uh, the the capitalist system, right? It is the smallest unit of the capitalist system, uh, which is bullshit because as far as I'm concerned, there's no family that operates on the basis of I'm only going to give you as much breast, breast milk as you earn today, child. Um, no, fam families are essentially communistic, right? Yeah. You know. That's 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 essentially how they operate. Um, so I don't I you know, and so the idea of Marx and um, Engels uh, that that the condition of family, the condition of the nuclear family, the condition of marriage was oppressive to women. It was exploitive to women. It placed men in a position of um, unjust and undeserved authority and all of those things and it subordinated women and all of those things. No, 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 no. Mary Harris Jones took a different approach. She said families need to stick together. When we protect minors, we're protecting families. When we protect minors and their rights and their right to a safe, safe working conditions and, and decent pay, um, we are protecting the women and children in their lives. And that is how we need to approach this. And that's how she got so much done. Right. And that's why I loved her approach so much, because she wasn't divide and conquer. She was like, let's all pull together and and work together against this, you know, against mining companies that want to give you a, a shit deal. And um, so she was the one who did things right. And in my view, it was it was all of the other movements during that period of time that were they just fell into that whole willingness to divide and conquer that, you know, that, that whole men and women are competitors. They, they can, they're in competition with each other. There's no such thing as complementarianism. Um, there's no such thing as, uh, as a man who sees his social status uh, as being dependent on his woman being able to stay home with the kids. This was common during the Industrial Revolution with the rise of the middle class. It was a marker of your status as a middle class man that your wife was able to stay home and not have to leave the house to work, right? But it was also a marker of the status of the family and that woman that she was allowed, she was able to do that, right? So it was something that both of them probably uh, agreed on in most cases that, you know, this is how we raise our status. This is how we project our status out towards the community 
in terms of, you know, I stay home and I look after the house and I look, at, look after the kids and I don't have to go outside of the house to work. And you go outside of the house to work and you're able to support the whole shebang on one income. That, that was a revolutionary development in the Industrial Revolution. It, it happened after work left the home. It happened after, um, you know, you, you didn't want to work anywhere close to home because you wouldn't want to live anywhere near a tannery because um, of the smell. And, you know, the, you wouldn't want to work anywhere near a factory because of the fumes. And you wouldn't want to work anywhere, you know. So the man, the man was the one who left the house and the woman was the one who stayed home. But when you're looking at the whole picture and you see how men and women have actually mutually sort of they had all through the thing mutually decided, you know, how things are going to be um, within their families. And then over time, you would see these sort of inklings of, of discontent from women. And then you would see men stepping back and letting women, you know, come forward a little bit. Right. It seems to be every single time women have asserted themselves. Right. And asserted uh, a demand uh, and not just a yeah, demand by, you know, 2000 uh, suffragettes in the uh, women's uh, social and political union in the UK, but the, you know, hundreds of thousands of suffragists in uh, Millicent Fawcett's uh, su suffrage society. Right. Um, when you actually had women on mass saying, OK, well, we want something different, um, you saw capitulation on the part of men. You saw men stepping back, making room, allowing for these changes. It wasn't always easy. Sometimes it yeah. was bumpy, but they allowed them in. They allowed them to, to try and do this. Right. And um, the the idea that's been perpetuated and most of it, all, a lot of it is from top down. It's coming from the Rupert Murdoch's of the world, the George Soros's of the world, right? That men and women should be at each other's throats um, is that that is not the reality of most of the people on the ground. It's not the reality of most of history. Most of history was just men and women scraping by as best they could and, you know, it, employing a division of labor that made made sense during the time um, yeah. for both. Right. It's um, one of the things. So um, I had the, had the discussion indeed w w with the sex worker, and um, I told her indeed about the, the oppressive uh, patriarchy uh, myth that it really is a myth. That historically, what it is is it's not that uh, men um, have been suppressive towards women. Though of course, indeed, for example, you have in, in the 60s and so when women enter the male workforce, of course you're going to have males that are threatened and then of course that's going to bring tension. But historically speaking, men and women have had unique roles throughout history. And the problem is that modern society tends to pathologize that. So, for example, in the 60s, they pathologized women, you know, when they tried to like, oh, OK, you're a woman, you can't do this, you can't do that. And now we're pathologizing men. But um, like an interesting example is when I ask people, think about the happiest time of your life. When was that? And then most people will answer when we were children. Why? Why were you the happiest when you were children? It's because your parents could create a world around you that was safe. And you yeah. had bedtime, you had curfews, you had rules to follow, and the rules protected you from that. And that's something that the radical feminists don't realize is that Historically speaking, men have protected women. It, it, it was not uh, an, an oppressive thing. We each indeed had unique roles. It wasn't like when, you know, we went out to hunt the mammoths where it's like, hey, okay, let's take the woman uh, as well, equality. No, it's like women are good at raising kids. Um, they are specifically designed, especially uh, from a young age, they actually have advantages to that. So, uh, for example, one of the traits, indeed, that's, that, that still kind of gets uh, pathologized about women is that they are neurotic. And um, when it comes to, like, if I had a choice between a mother being neurotic, a neurotic or a mother not being neurotic, uh, when she has a young child, I'll choose for the neurotic mother because that uh, there's a higher chance of safety in that. You know that a mother yes. is always 
watching out. And yes, um, no, even even stuff like um, women are less uh, tolerant of extreme heat and extreme cold, right? You know, you hear this with the feminist complaint about sexist air conditioning, right? Um, well, there's a reason for that. You know, women didn't just evolve as women. They evolved as the mother-child dyad, right? They evolved t with the assumption, because that assumption has been correct over, like, millions of years of history, with the assumption that they're going to be in close proximity to their much more vulnerable infants. And so, therefore, when mom feels cold, she goes and checks to make sure baby's not cold as well, because even though mom, even though women can, like in the survival sense, they can tolerate extremes of heat and cold all, about as good as men can, right? Um, in the sensation sense, in the feeling like it's uh, feeling discomfort at that sense, um, they're, they're much more susceptible to that. They, they're much more susceptible to feeling really, really, really uncomfortable when it's too hot or too cold. Well, because when you feel too hot or too cold, you check on your baby to make sure your baby isn't going to die by freezing to death or from, from heat exhaustion. That, yeah, that's why that's there. And right? it's the same with, uh, with safe spaces. So, for example, uh, for guys, safe spaces is a new thing. But for women, you know, since, since the beginning of mankind, women have always had safe spaces. But the thing is that they were allocated for their kids. And now what is happening, seeing that women are entering the workforce more and more, they're still taking that mentality of safe spaces and they're projecting it in the male workforce, which yes. is a disaster because it's one thing to try and make your children safe, but if you try to make everyone safe, you're going to stop progress and you're going to fall behind and you're going to piss men off. And that's indeed what I see uh, happening now. Well, and I, I also would say that, you know, the, the workplace or the public sphere operates the way it does because men who were the ones who built it, right? Men were the ones who created that superstructure or that set of superstructures, right? And they created it in that way because that's the only way it can exist, right? So you have, you have this idea that, okay, we need to make the workplace more women-friendly, right? And so uh, it needs to be more empathy-based and, and all of that and compassion-based and interpersonal relationship-based and, you know, and all of these touchy-feely qualities that women really like, right? But that's not how a corporate organization or a military or a government can operate. They can't operate based on hugs and feeling good and caring about everybody in the organ Like, if I'm sitting in an office building, I don't give a shit about that guy 15 floors up who I've never met. I could care fucking less, okay? And I might care more about the guy at the desk next to me um, and, and his personal problems and how he feels about, you know, his life and his day and, and his, his issues, right? But I don't care about him as much as I care about my kids, right? So empathy is not reliable, not in a structure big enough to actually get, I don't know, a freeway built or like a 30-story office tower built or, you know, create a, an electrical grid. It, you can't operate those kinds of superstructures based on female values. You just can't. It doesn't work, right? You need the less personal, uh, the more shallow but broader spectrum of relationships that men are capable of cultivating that men use to build those things, right? And the reason why it was men who built those things was because it was men who were willing to go into the unsafe arena of, you know, relating to other individuals in ways that weren't based entirely on kinship bonds and empathy, Right. You know, it yeah. was men who built the world of tit for tat reciprocal altruism and they built it in a world where, you know, if you pissed the other guy off or didn't give him exactly what he wanted, he got bashed over the head. Right. Yeah. Women weren't willing to build that shit. Now they are coming in and saying, oh, all of this, all of this that built the entirety of society. Right. All of this is wrong and bad, and you need to change it and turn it into a nursery. That's what they're saying, 
You need to bubble wrap it, and we need to have like weekly affirmation meetings where we talk about our feelings and and affirm each other's like worthiness as people and and productivity. Who cares? It's like one of the biggest differences、um, between men and women is that men are willing to take more risks, and the thing about risks is that it gets you to the top. But、yep. it's also more likely to get you to the bottom, and that's one thing that the radical feminists do not understand. All they do is they look at the top, and they forget the bottom. Just like with the incels, you know, you look at the top, and you forget、yep. the bottom, and you can、yep. only do that so long because indeed the incels、uh, um, are growing. And one of the things though that I find really curious,、um, especially、uh, when I came, because I used to live in Africa for、uh, for for thirteen years, so like I. I I understand a bit more like what what rape culture is and 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 really the, the the severity of that and one of the things that I realized like when when I came here and then when I slowly saw how the media was starting to treat men and especially white men it's like for me like as a black guy like I'm sometimes standing up. For white men and the way that they're treated, it's like it's it's an absolute disrespect. In fact, there was this、um, TV series. It's it's a, a new one. I think it was released a couple of months ago. It was called Diet Land. I don't know if you've heard of it. No. Okay.、Uh, the 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 the,、um, the story is is fascinating and at the same time quite shocking.、Uh, what it is, it's it's about a well. Part of it is the fat acceptance movement. It's a, a fat protagonist, and then you know we should all feel sorry for her. But what really caught me was the underlying story、um, of radical feminists who were kidnapping, torturing,、um, and then dumping、uh, men on the street, and also sometimes setting them on fire, and so on and so forth. And that by itself didn't bother me. But what bothered me was. Um, how the people in the film reacted. It was the the woman when these radical feminists were doing these acts. The women were happy. It, it was celebrated. The only time that the tide turned was when the radical feminist movement started going after porn stars and other people that they did. Right. But like what I'm saying is like. They're kind of like normalizing the accept the the, the acceptance of、uh, um, of of male violence. So you know the 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 the, the murder of men、right. by a radical feminist organization. No judge, no jury. If they are expected, if they are suspected of sexual assaults or rape, and that really surprised me that such a show. Could have been made, where it's like nobody was like, "Hmm, is this really a good idea? Maybe this puts men in a in in a bad picture." Because I really felt disgusted、um, uh, when I watched that. Well, did you did you ever watch that episode、uh, or the clips from the episode of the talk that was talking about Catherine Q. Becker、um, having、uh, cut her husband's oh, yeah, penis, yeah, penis off? Yeah. Right,、yeah. and and, then, and、uh, you have Sharon Osbourne, yeah. yeah, yeah, saying yeah. it's fabulous. I don't know, I don't know what the issues were between them, but I have to say it's fabulous, right? And、uh, and you have all of these women just thinking that it's hilarious, and that's not anything new. That's not an aberration. I mean, back in the what was it, the nineties, I believe,、um, you had、uh, Lorena Bobbitt cut her husband's. Penis off, and、uh, when when she was、uh, put on trial for that, outside the courtroom, feminist groups were、uh, hosting a carnival style、uh, picnic, like a you know a barbecue,、um, where they were serving cocktail wieners with lots of ketchup. Um, you know, to commemorate this, and you also had、um, a feminist group. In a radical feminist organization in was it Ecuador? I believe was where Lorena Bobbitt was from um, it, originally. Um, they threatened to castrate 100 American men. They phoned in this threat to numerous media outlets if she spent even one night in prison over doing what she did to her husband. And the hilarious thing—well, it's not hilarious, but the The horrible thing, I guess that it's funny. It's just not ha ha funny、um, about the whole situation was that when Lorena Bobbitt was arrested,、um, the statement that she gave to the police was along the lines of,、um, 
Uh, he always has an orgasm before I do. He never waits for me to have an orgasm. I think it's selfish, so I pulled back the sheets and I did it. And so there was nothing in the initial statement that she gave that indicated that there was any kind of abuse going on in that relationship whatsoever, right? Nothing came out at trial that was even remotely substantiated by fact-finding that there was any abuse. But the feminist movement, the moment that there was any kind of suggestion by Lorena Bobbitt's attorneys that the relationship was, you know, rocky or, you know, volatile between them, right? They seized on this idea that, oh, yeah, he was a wife batterer and she was justified in what she did. Right. So, I mean, the entire thing was spun by feminist groups as being a woman striking back at a man who beat her and, and treated her like dirt and, and abused her and all of this stuff. There's there's never been any evidence that that was actually the case. The only yeah. evidence of why she did it was because she found him sexually selfish in bed. Yeah, and, and then one of the things that I'm hoping for is that the regular woman, uh, that, that they wake up to what's going on because what it is is when you demonize white men, those white men were your potential allies. Those white men could have been fighting on your side, but if you continuously demonize them, they go over to the other side. So what you're essentially doing is you're creating more problems. And I know indeed that's the feminist strategy of, you know, victimhood and, you know, getting sympathy of that. But for the average woman, they need to realize that indeed men are becoming more frustrated and their sympathies are becoming less. And one of the things um, that I also want to talk about is like, um, for example, like where where um, where are things going uh, um, as far as, as as the dynamics go, um, uh, power dynamics between men and women? Because currently now, indeed, women have a lot of power, but that is going to change. There are going to be major uh, shifts that women really need to realize and need to wake up on. And one of them, indeed, is uh, male birth control. Um, recently, I think it was a couple of months ago, uh, a TED Talk presented um, that they were now starting tests on a non-hormonal birth control. And the reason right. why I say non-hormonal is because it's very important non-hormonal, seeing that most birth control um, is is hormonal, except of course, you know, like uh, the, the 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 condoms and stuff like that. But you know, as most adults know, condoms suck, so we can throw that out of the window. So then yeah, no, this is this you're talking about Rysug or Vassal gel, right? Um, uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about because uh, Vasa gel is then actually gel that, that that blocks the sperm. No, I'm talking about actual non-hormonal uh, birth control where you take a pill and oh. then it targets a specific vitamin that stops the production um, of sperm. Oh. So it, it makes it impotent. So that is what they're currently uh, um, starting on human trials. And I think that maybe in the next 10 years or so uh, that that will hit the market. And that will be revolutionary because it is actually then better than the current birth control of women. So yeah. what is going to happen is then that, you know, not only are men going to use it, but women are going to stop using it because women, they hate birth control. Like I know my sister, she tried several birth controls and every time her body kept rejecting it. Uh, and, you know, and eventually she went off and she got pregnant, but that's another story. But um, yeah, so it's uh, th uh, there are serious birth control struggles. And also in my documentary, I talk about the effect that birth control has on women psychologically. Like mm -hmm. the average woman today is not, in, in, at least in, well, I think birth control has spread, but especially in Western society, it's being used a lot. The average woman in Western society today is psychologically and hormonally not um, in their natural state. Um, and one of the things that birth control does is um, uh, is it blocks the natural peak um, uh, that you get 
just before you go into uh, ovulation. Oh, ovulation, yeah. yeah so uh, women are less likely to take sexual risks, and basically they 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 they, they flatline, and that psychologically has uh, has a thing on you. Another thing that happens is that well, they're they're two main types of birth control, one um, that, th that uses more testosterone and the other one that uses yes. estrogen. And then when you use estrogen, you go more towards the female side and your breasts become bigger, which is a good thing. The breast size has increased in Britain, I think, uh, um, I think in the last hundred years by two cup sizes. So that's right. good. But on the other hand, you have then that you have ultra- feminine woman and then the more you go to the feminine the less you understand the masculine so True. that that indeed is also um a, a serious problem where like the natural state of woman and um uh the sex worker also gave a personal example because um uh birth control also some birth control, so not all, but some birth control also blocks uh, the natural sense and sense of smell as far as sexuality goes. And she yeah. said as soon as she stopped birth control, within a couple of weeks, she met her partner for life. She walking down the street, smell, yeah. and, and, yeah. and, oh, they, yeah. and they were locked up. So I, I, I have to, I have to, you know, I have to say that that that's absolutely 100 percent true um you know like i was on birth control when i met my uh ex-husband um then after we had had our two kids right so spent pretty much the entirety of the the relationship either uh pregnant or nursing or on birth control um, but after we'd had that and I, I went off birth control, uh, I just couldn't stand the, what it did to, you know, what it did to my sex drive, what it did to my hormones, what it did to, you know, everything. Um, so all of a sudden I really didn't like the way he smelled all of a sudden. Right. And, um, then, you know, 10 years later or eight years later, however long uh, after getting, you know, my divorce, Dog, I'm squirting you. I will squirt the – go lie down. Um, after I, I went and got uh, my divorce and, and started reading up on it, um, and Milo Yiannopoulos put it this way, you know, um, which is maybe a, a glib and flamboyant and provocative way to put it, it turns women into Lannisters, um, you know, from Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. uh, Right. Like it shuts off a mechanism that is there to prevent you from mating with your close kin. Um, so essentially, when you're uh, not pregnant, right, you you find the smell, the body odor of your close male kin as a woman to, to you find it really unpleasant. And so you don't want to you don't want to really be physically too, too close to them. And when you get pregnant, now that danger of being impregnated by your close male kin, it's there's no danger there. So that mechanism switches off. And because you want to be when you're vulnerable like that, you want to be around your close. You don't want to avoid your close male kin. They'll protect you. Right. And there's no danger of impregnation. Right. So essentially that turns off when you're pregnant. Well, birth control, many types of birth control mimic the hormonal state of pregnancy. And so it turns off that mechanism where you smell somebody who's genetically incompatible with you and you don't want to have sex with them. Right. It makes you not want to have sex with them. It turns off that entire system of seeing some men as smelling really good just their natural scent and other men as smelling really bad now with the guy i'm with now who i met after i had my tubes tied and he's had a vasectomy and so we didn't have to worry about any of that um i could literally stick my nose in his armpit and just breathe in and it smells really good and i know that sounds gross but it smells really good to me um, and that sense of smell that women have that that, you know, like women are better able to identify their newborns by smelling a onesie that their newborn was wearing than by looking at them. Right. They're more accurate 
with their sense of smell than they are with looking at their babies within a couple of days of giving birth, right? So, I mean, this is this is a huge mechanism that gets turned off by birth control. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, okay, well, my my kids are all a little bit weird, right? They all have issues that you wouldn't consider to be issues that normal kids would have, right? So delayed lang- onset of language, um, you know, uh, my older two have, you know, social issues with social cognitive development and things like that. They've, they've always had those. Um, and, and I'm thinking, you know, like, is this because I chose a man um, who, once I went off birth control, I couldn't stand the smell of him? And one of the things that marriage counselors have actually said is, you know, you'd be amazed at how many middle-aged couples we have in our office where she says, I can't stand the way he smells. Well, you know, did you feel that way when you got married? No. Did you feel that way during the marriage? No. When did you start feeling that way? When he had a vasectomy or I got my tubes tied and I went off hormonal birth control and then all of a sudden I can't stand the way he smells. And so, like, what are we doing, right? Um, And in terms of, you know, I would like to say that, you know, Vassal Gel, that's going to be Uh, because that's looking like it's going to be approved earlier than this other form of a pill that you're talking about. It's super reversible. It's very non-invasive. And it's highly effective, right? And it's invisible. It's something that you don't, you wouldn't even need to remember to take a pill every day. You just go into your doctor and they give you an injection and it's, or two injections. It's good for 10 years. And uh, you can reverse it anytime you want, and within a couple months, you're back to normal. Yeah, indeed. So, like, as, as so, far indeed. Yeah, it's going to be, I think that when that comes out in particular, that's going to be a game changer because you won't be able to find women who, you know, can lie about birth control and then get pregnant and trap men into fatherhood. Um, you will actually have to find women willing to bargain with men. I can guarantee you all the pickup artists out there, they'll be lining up to get this, right? Yeah, all the players, true. all that top 20% of guys, all the guys who can actually pull pussy, right? They're going to be lining up to get this. The, the, there have been those some problems um, as far as the trials go in, in India where, like, some people, uh, I think it was, like, peeing blood and, and, and other stuff like that. But maybe, indeed, they, they, they have the kinks work out. But as far, indeed, as implementation goes, um, it's, indeed, a lot easier. It's, indeed, one-shot injection in, in the scrotum, and then that's it. There are, however, problems with that. Like, if we look at it from a purely economic point of view where you have major – a multi-million dollar corporation. Oh, they want, who, they want you to take a pill. pill they they want to treat cancer. They don't want to cure it. Yeah. They want to treat things. They don't want to cure them. Um, yeah, yeah so, they, they don't want, they don't want to do a $10 injection into, into a man's scrotum that's good for 10 years. They'd rather have him pay $30 a month for a pill he has to take yeah, every day. Indeed. For sure. Indeed. So yeah. it's, um, it's, it's true because indeed, uh, um, uh, am I saying correct? Vasagel? Gel. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, th- that has been around, I think, for a couple of years. It, it, it's it's still not approved in the U.S. Yeah, no, it's not approved in the U.S. It's in clinical trials, and the clinical trials have actually been crowdfunded. Oh. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's they don't have the backing. It's it's uh, the Par- Par- Parsius Foundation or something like that that's that's doing this. Um, but they, most of the funding that they get is actually from private donations from individual citizens. It's not from phar- pharmaceutical companies. You're absolutely right about that. Um, that's an issue when it comes to any pharmaceutical company that wants to invest in a new technology is they're looking at, okay, yeah, how's this going to pay it's off? Indeed, it's, it's not really that investable. Um, it's like then like best case scenario, you would have like a, a billionaire entrepreneur who has a heart of gold and, you know, decides to push it out there. Then, indeed, we could be talking about a, a revolution. I'm going to I'm going to reach out to Elon Musk ASAP. See what he has to say. You can say. try. You can try. Like, yeah. 
I'm curious to see how 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 he'll react. A- another thing um, th- that is coming down the pipeline that that no one's really talking about and that is quite worrying, or at least it, it worries me a lot, is that um, let's see. It's a little bit hard to explain, but 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 I'll I'll, I'll try explaining it. It's um, 3D. Oh, hold on, realistic 3D porn sex tapes. And I know it might sound totally weird, but um um uh, but, but but let me explain. So I have a background in 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 3D and in animation, so I'm um. Uh, I'm on top of that. And um, one of the things um, th- that I did of research is I looked at a lot of st- statistics uh, for the documentaries that I do because they're about sexuality. And um, one of the things that really struck me was, um, um, you know, the site Pornhub, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Pornhub. Oh, is- do I? Do okay. I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. So, um, so Pornhub indeed is is the most popular porn site in the world. It's not the most visited. That's X videos, but it's the most popular. And one of the things that really struck me was um, I was looking at the statistics of the most uh, searched uh, uh, search terms, the most searched words of the year. And one of the things that really surprised me was Overwatch. Uh, so, for example, in Brazil. Overwatch in 2016 was the most searched word. In Russia, Overwatch was the most searched word. In Spain, um, Overwatch, apart from the actual language Spanish, but you can discount that, uh, Overwatch was also the most um, searched word. And um, at first, I dismissed it. At first, I was like, okay, this is an anomaly because I also read an article about Overwatch porn. I was like, what the F is that? And then... um, but but later I I, I came back um, um, I came back to it and I realized that without us noticing a small silent yet growing revolution is happening right under uh, right under our feet and um, it's the revolution of um, user generated 3D porn the reason why Overwatch is so popular. And for the people who don't know what Overwatch is, Overwatch is a popular shooting game, multiplayer online shooting game, similar to uh, Call of Duty, but then it has its own personal uh, characters. Um, it's got it's got a, a whole uh, sort of fantasy spin to it, rather yeah. than realistic, right? So yeah. you know, people have magical powers, and people have uh, so it's sort of a combination between sword and sorcery and ancient Japanese mythology and um, Team Fortress 2. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And um, what it is is that the reason why Overwatch is beating all of the other categories, so they're beating MELF, they're beating big butts, they're beating big cocks, it's really like the number one in a lot of countries, um, is because it's user generated. And what happened is a combination of uh, a couple of technologies. But the main thing is Source Filmmaker. And Source Filmmaker um, is a 3D program that for the first time allowed users to create real time 3D rendering. And okay. that, that, that real time thing is really important because it's something that most people don't know. It's like you can kind of compare it to Apple when it first came out. That Previous, the previous computers were like for computer nerds and you had to know your stuff and there wasn't really a screen. Nothing was really integrated. Apple was the first one to create a fully interactive real time display. So in the past, if you wanted to code, you had to type, type, type and then enter and then type, 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 enter. But Apple allowed you for the first time to directly interact and actually see in real time what you're doing. Right. That's also what Source Filmmaker um, uh, um, uh, did, that for the first time, and it's a free program where users could create real-time 3D, where in the past it would take them sometimes hours or minutes to, 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 well, actually, it was actually impossible to do it real-time. You would see wireframe things and stuff that wouldn't look like what it looked like. And one of the things that I realized with that is that how problematic um, it is in the in the whole gender war thing because 
for the first time in history, women will lose their digital agency. And um, what I mean by that is that um, today, if a woman wants to be naked on the internet, she can take a picture of herself and, and put it on there. But what is going to happen in roughly 10 to 15 years is that the technology of 3D is going to become so realistic yeah. that other people can recreate you. And it's yeah. going to be a combination of a couple of things. One is a program either similar to Source Filmmaker or Blender, that's another open source thing. Um, another is artificial intelligence with um, audio voice artificial intelligence. You know the Google presentation, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, indeed, of Google Assistants, where they could artificially generate um, a, 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 a voice. Um, that is basically going to happen. So we currently already have the technology now, and um, Adobe actually did a presentation of that. I think it was like two years ago where they took a piece of voice just from a, a person, I think it was a celebrity, um, and they analyzed it, and then they could make that celebrity say anything uh, that they wanted. Um, right. So that technology is also coming. So you have, on the one hand, um, uh, software. On the other hand, you have artificial in, in intelligence, and uh, the last piece of that are the graphics. And the reason why I say 10 to 15 years is because um, every year you can kind of like see that the graphics are getting better. So right. you kind of have an idea of like, okay, where are we now? And currently we're at the verge of the uncanny valley. Um, right. NVIDIA recently, um, I think it was uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, released a demo showing real-time generated graphics where it looked almost it was just little tiny things with the eyes where you could uh, kind of see, but it had the computer power to generate that in real life. And Yeah, in real time, yeah. like not, not the cut scenes in the video games, but the actual fighting scenes. Yeah, type thing. yeah, yeah. indeed. And the reason why I'm so worried is that Pretty soon, that technology will be available, 10 to 15 years will be available to the public. And at first, we will almost reach the uncanny valley. Then we will pass the uncanny valley. And when we pass the uncanny valley, what is going to happen is especially guys are going to adopt this technology more than girls. And then what are they going to do? So, for example, if you take the, 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 the incels, and the radical incels are of all the groups I've seen, like the most hateful group. It's like worse than the Nazis, worse than the radical feminists. So what are they going to do? They are going to misuse that technology. One of the reasons why Adobe stopped their production or th their release of their software was because they were afraid of the implementations. But the truth is the cat is already out the bag. Um, yeah. All major platforms, Google, Facebook, and other companies are working on AI things. So what is going to happen is in the future, women are going to lose their sexual agency. And especially I'm worried about, you know, like in this gender war, things well, are going to lose their sexual bargaining power, too. Right. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Then they're they're, they're going to lose their sexual bargaining power, too. They're going to lose their the necessity that like they they have, you know, like. Everything seems to be about uh, women being able to bargain for, as, you know, what they want in return mm -hmm. for their sexuality. And if men no longer want or need their sexuality, then they, they've lost their bargaining power. Um, so there you go. Just one second. Yeah. I, they, yes, it's on the stove, but I I didn't forget about it. I turned it off. Uh, but I'll, I'll be only a few more minutes, and then I'm very I, I don't, I don't, can't help you right now. Yeah. No, I can't. And don't walk in front of the camera in your underpants. See, I'm going to have to cut that part out again, too, <laughs> now. Okay. Um, oh, look, baconets. Take them and go. Take them and go. Shoo. Shoo. Sorry, that's my man. He's hungry. He slept in this morning, and okay. he got up, like, five minutes before uh, 11 o'clock. So um, 
So it's like, okay, uh, yeah, no, now you're going to have to wait. So, but, oh, yeah, okay. But, um, yeah. yeah, so um, what I mean with this technology is that the, 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 the possibility of revenge um, is, is, is huge and, um, yeah. And 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 the, the, the um, a, a, as you know, like more and more women's lives are becoming online. You know, what is online now for a lot of women is becoming more important than what is offline. And once that can be synthesized and replicated, and then you know, abused, where you know, like uh, for example, um, it, it actually has effect on, on on a lot of things. So the, the first people that will be targeted, of course, are the celebrities like uh T V uh news hosts or, 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 or actors were like for example like T Y T the the young Turks, Jenk and um let's see, what's the other girl's name again? Anna. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for example, if a fake sex state were to be made of them that is realistic, they're going to have a problem, you know, because they have spouses and then they have to be like, okay, well, you know, it's not me. Well, it looks like you. It sounds like you. It acts right. like you. Um, that is one thing. Another thing is that um, the, 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 the political um, consequences of that where it's going to be politicized, for example, to take out an opponent. But even it, it goes even further than that. For example, it can even reach the royal family where, for example, if someone were to make a realistic sex tape of Princess Diana, who is dead, uh, but then, you know, people watching like, okay, you know, like who did she have sex with because there were several scandals. Then the royal family will even have to make an official announcement like, mm, it's not us. Da, 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 da. But, you know, yeah. try and convince the people if it looks real. And, of course, the last remaining part is the uh, the, 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 the personal revenge uh, sex tapes um, where if uh, you're angry or if a guy is angry at a girlfriend, then, you know, right. instead of just typing like men do now, they actually have the ability to r create realistic sex tapes that can ruin people's lives. You can send it to someone's uh, family and then try and explain that it's not you. It sounds like you. It talks like you. It acts like you. Yeah. So th that is where we're heading. And I'm very worried that if we continue in this gender war, that things are going to get very, very nasty, especially with that technology. Yeah, no, I, you know, that's something I have to admit I hadn't really considered. Um, but I can agree that, you know, any kind of weapon that you can put in somebody's hands in the middle of a war is uh, is going to be something that's going to be used. Um, you know, and that's, you know, part of the reason why I'd really, you know, like when I gave my, my speech at ICMI, um, yeah, the I International it. It was Conference. Yeah, yeah, the International Conference on Men's Issues, uh, just like in, what was it, July of this year, um, I talked a lot about how men and women are fellow travelers and how we need to actually pull together and um, how women have to stick up for their men the way men have always um, been willing, uh, at least to some degree, you know, a significant number of men willing to stick up for their, their women. Um, so... Essentially, um, I think that the the rift needs to be healed, absolutely. And and it's um, you know like there there was just a I don't know if you've seen it yet. Um, Buzzfeed came out with a Netflix mini documentary series, and I'm featured in uh, one of the episodes on the men's rights movement. Uh, it just came out yesterday or the day before. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, and and they open with. Um, a discussion of the word, what was that? Is there something? Oh, you had children playing outside. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, and I got my dog squeaking because she wants to be out and making all kinds of noise. Um, but essentially, uh, it opened on, like, I did a 90-plus minute interview with, uh, with the host of this show. And uh, it was uh, mostly civil interview where we discussed the issues we disagreed on a lot of things but it was all very civil and uh, but she brought up this, this one issue where you know in a video that I'd made a year before 
um, where I had been essentially uh, take, tearing apart some of the, her public statements about the men's rights movement. I'd used the C word. And, uh, yeah. And so that was like the big issue for her was I called her a cunt. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and she's like, you seem so polite. This is this is how the interview went. You seem so polite right now. You know, I'm surprised. And I'm like, why are you surprised? I'm always polite when I talk to people. She says, well, you did call me a cunt. And I'm like, oh, did I? I don't recall. And she says, are you denying it? And I'm like, no, I'm for, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I had had occasion to call you a cunt in the past. Um, but I just don't recall. Um, and she says, oh, it was on this, this video that you did. And you just, then you started talking about my facial expressions and my mouth and stuff. And I'm like, oh God, that's Allison. She pauses the video when we do Ren Zerkers together, right? She pauses the video and she analyzes micro expressions, right? Facial micro expressions. Oh, look, look, this is a sign of somebody who's conning you. This is the this is the facial expression of somebody who's smug or contemptuous or whatever, right? And um, she's like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, I did call you a cunt. Um, and uh, and then she says, well, have you changed your mind since meeting me in person? And I'm like, mm, no. And uh, no, no. Why would that change my mind? Like, you haven't given me any indication that you're not. So. You know, like we can continue the conversation. I might change my mind, but I haven't yet changed my mind. And then she was just like, she just looked like I'd forced her to eat dog poo. Um, like the look on her face was just abs. And that was how they opened the show. And then they opened the show with that and me saying, no, I don't take it back. And then they inserted a clip of me laughing from some other point half an hour further into the interview relating to something else completely and i'm like you know so who's perpetuating this gender war they they boiled a 90 plus hour inter uh, 90 plus minute interview into about three minutes of commentary from me the most important thing being that at some point a year prior in a video i never expected her to watch in which i was not addressing her in particular you know i was talking about her not to her Right. I called her a cunt. And it's like. This is where we are. This is where we are. This is why we can't find common ground. Do you know how many men I've called cunts? You know, like lots, lots. Right. This is just how I talk. Yeah. And, you know, like, honestly, geez, how many men have you called dicks? Right. Yeah, probably a lot. (laughs) A lot, I'm guessing. Right. I've called lots of people dicks, too. Right. Like, I, I don't. Yeah. But anyway, um, I need to get going because it has been almost two hours now and I really appreciate talking to you. And okay. um, can, can I say one more thing? Because I, I want to end on a positive note. Okay. Um, I, I was thinking about the, the, the MRA movement and and maybe um, um, I, I, I can give. Um, um, some, um, 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 some, some advice, like, uh, some, some tips and ideas. Um, so one of the things, because you know, I, I watched your, um, your conference, which was indeed, uh, very good. Um, one of the things th- th- that I think, um, um, is missing in the MRA movement is, um, in- inclusivity, uh, where, for example, you're currently called, MRA, which stands for Men's Rights Activist, but what if you add um, a B to it, so Boys and Men's Rights Activist? Wouldn't you then be able to change the conversation where, for example, the mainstream um, can't easily dismiss you or easily ignore you or easily make fun of you? If you put boys' uh, um, um, issues um, in, uh, um, in, in front where it's like, if you, for example, promote yourself as putting boys first, then what will happen is that uh, women and mothers and people who might be afraid of the organization will be like, hey, wait, okay, boys are in it. Maybe I should join or maybe I want to know uh, more about it. Um, and that, I think- that is actually the only uh, 
recent suggestion in terms of changing our name that I see as in any way valid is at the addition of boys. And I try to, when I talk about stuff, I, I try to deal, you know, like say as much as possible or, or whenever possible, you know, like the issues of men and boys. Um, so yeah, no, I agree. And it makes it a lot harder to, um, to criticize when you're championing, uh, children for sure. Um, and uh, and so yes, I I will take that suggestion on board, and I will actually probably um, post a, a thing on maybe the men's rights subreddit or something like that uh, in terms of that. Um, but what I will say as well is you know um, the the term men's rights activist uh, isn't really one that men's rights activists took for themselves; it was applied to them by opponents um so you know like back in the 80s and 90s right it was applied to them by opponents right so it's it's like essentially when you get labeled a white supremacist or something like that well you know and then eventually you're just like okay or a white nationalist or something okay i'm a white nationalist um because that's you know like that's what you're going to be called regardless so um that that's part of the reason why that that label has stuck is because it's one that both sides agree on. So, yeah. But yeah, I think really like if you can, um, and then like have a serious discussion with really like the, the top people and then like reach out because what it is, is if you are able to also add boys to it and become BMRAs, you could really turn this into a global issue because as you know, according to Warren Farrell, uh, the top 70 developed nations um, in all aspects, all criteria, boys are lagging behind. So you also mm. have the statistics uh, right. behind you. And if you could, for example, also uh, make a documentary. So I know that uh, um, the red pill was made, but it was made from the perspective of a girl who explores the MRAs. But if you can make it from a sp perspective where you start with boys issues and then later in the documentary migrate uh, to men, because, you know, as you know, boys also grow up. Like, right. I think then that you can be able to capture an entirely new audience that you couldn't be for because the mainstream can't ignore you. And I'm guessing that there are plenty of your fans who would love to make a, a documentary. So like I really like think that like if you guys like really like organize and like figure out like okay, let's market ourselves and how are we going to position ourselves and actually right. start thinking like the large feminist organizations, then you'll be able to compete with them and with the BMRAs possibly be able to actually beat them at their own game and help boys and then men in turn in the process. And like, it's, I, let me put it to like, I see the, the endless possibilities if B gets, gets implemented and if all people start calling themselves B MRAs because then you cannot make fun anymore of it. Boys are indeed, uh, um, I guess cross Vulnerable. is a large word, but compared to girls, they are in, in, in crisis. They are behind uh, um, on, on a lot of things. And I think also boys themselves, like once they see that organizations or a organization, the BMRAs care about them, then they themselves will also grow up and be able uh, to help. So it's, it, okay. that at least would be my advice to seriously consider that and see if you can also link up with other MRAs uh, from other countries and put B in front of it and become one united organization because right. then people can't make fun of you anymore and the people will really have to take you uh, seriously. Well, I think that's I think it's worth a shot and yeah no and I do think that it's, that's actually the you know the the one suggestion that I've heard that that doesn't fundamentally annoy me. Um, you know, in terms of changing your name, oh, you have to change your name away from, you have to get the men's out of, out of the name is usually what the suggestion is, um, as, as opposed to adding, uh, something to it. So, um, yeah, no, that's a good suggestion. I will actually raise it with people. Um, now I'm going to go pretty quick cause I have to strangle my dog. 
um, and uh, then sell her to one of the local restaurants. I'm not sure which one. Um, or maybe the grocery store, um, because she is annoying me very, very much right now. Um, and I, I really love her. She's, she's a sweetie. And, and I just spent $650 having her spayed, so I'm probably not going to, you know, have her cut up for any, any, anybody's dinner. Um, but, uh, boy, she annoys me though. Um, but, uh, I do want you to plug your documentaries. I oh, had yeah. I had completely forgotten that you were the person who was responsible for Are All Men Pedophiles? Yeah, it's like I, I don't look the part, right? <laughs> well, no, it was I just I remember what you sending me the link years and years ago and me watching it and I I gave a bit of a, a review of it and like I found it to be a very thought provoking and and good treatment of that question which is sort of the the question of you know uh what is normal sexuality and where does it cross the line and and uh it's you know and sort of presenting the case that it's really not abnormal for people for adults to be sexually attracted to um pubescent uh underage but sexually yeah. mature yeah, like, Young like 17 people, right? and stuff like that. So, for yeah. example, Asia Arganto, like her case, like, am I saying yeah. it correctly? Asia Argento. Yeah. Asia Argento. Yeah. So, yeah, she, she slept with a, with a 17 year old. So it goes indeed for both cases, for both men and women. And like people indeed, they can't even tell the difference. You show a 17 year old and an 18 year old, but you know, somehow magically we're, we're, we're supposed to know. Um, so indeed yeah. it's, it's, it's it, it, it's it's a blurred uh, well, it's kind of, line. It's kind of like that thing where you know um, when you're pregnant, right, and then your belly button goes from being an innie to an Audi, and it's like a turkey based uh, turkey timer, right? Mm -hmm. Where that when it hits the right temperature, the little button pops out. Um, you know when you're roasting a turkey, and and that that like all kids have uh, have like one of those sticking out of their head, a little red button that pops out when they're when the, the time comes that they're like legally of age to consent and that's when we all notice or something. No, no, it's not. That's not how it works. But, um, but yeah, people act like that. That's how, how it should be. And I have resisted um, correcting people who have called Asia Argento a um, pedophile because I don't, I don't think that the Jimmy Bennett, Thing indicates that she's a pedophile, although um, I do find it weird that she befriended him when he was seven, that they call each other mommy and son, and uh, um, she also has some things on her Instagram that make me think that maybe this isn't just uh, hebophilia. Um, that, that that maybe she does have an unhealthy interest in in boys who are not pubescent. So, um, if, but if, if I, that's the case, then then like um, I'm guessing that other people will will also come out of the woodwork. If it's yeah, the case. and yeah. and I'm reserving judgment on that for now. So, but you know, I having a liaison with a 17 year old uh, person, whether you're male or female, does not indicate pedophilia. It just doesn't. So. Yeah, it's at the most, it's, it's hebophilia, and technically it's indeed like um, 16 plus, it's, it's already um, legally, um, it, it can already be considered a adult, so it wouldn't fall under, under uh, well, I mean like the definition of pedophilia, if you look according to DSM, I'm not talking about the age of consent, right. that's different per country, and in yeah. some cases in the USA per state, but I'm talking about the official right. uh, definition according to the uh, diagnostic manual of, uh, right. of uh, statistical diseases. So um, according to that, indeed, it's um, everything under 16. Technically, he was 17, though. I suspect, indeed, you know, you also uh, saw the tweets that it might have been going on earlier, that, you know, that that is yeah. the that, that is the, the, the part that was caught where it's like red handed, where there are photos, they haven't been published, but there are photos of them together, topless, in bed, and he's underage. So I wonder how that is going to play out. That's the, 
hashtag reverse me too movement or how oh, yeah uh, how no, that i mean she's 37 he's 17 um he arrived with uh, uh an adult supervisor parent or something like that and you know for the meeting in the in the hotel and then she sent that person away and uh yeah no it it just you know just just because it's not necessarily a a you know abnormal philia um you know, it doesn't doesn't mean it's not exploitive, um, just like um, Harvey Weinstein. Um, yeah. You or know, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's you look. OK, so should we say because Harvey Weinstein only uh, preyed on women who were over the age of consent, that there was no predatory behavior going on there, that there was no imbalance of power, that there was no. Uh, older, much more experienced person who was, you know, possibly taking advantage of somebody who really didn't know um, how to conduct themselves in that situation and and look out for their own interests. I mean, like we wouldn't say that if it was if the roles were reversed and it was a 37 year old man and a 17 year old woman, we would we would at least be, be asking the questions. Um, and uh, but. Uh, so that was a great documentary. I actually really enjoyed that one. This one um, is uh, what? What is it called? Do women have a higher sex drive? Do women have a higher sex drive? I think personally, I think the jury is out on that. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, it's hard to it's hard to actually determine uh, that question because women's and men's yeah, sex drives are fundamentally different. Um, they operate through entirely different mechanisms, so it's it's kind of difficult to actually pin an answer on that. But um, I found what I watched of it to be really enjoyable and, and interesting, and um, and I would recommend it to anybody to give it a watch. So, and uh, I, I look forward to the next documentary you send me. So. Yeah, thank you. And like, I'll, I'll send you a, a link of the. Uh, of the documentary link where people can go to uh, buy uh, or watch the documentary. All right, perfect. And I will post it. So um, thanks so much for coming on. And um, and I'm going to go kill my dog now and uh, feed my husband. And then all will be right in the universe. Yeah, let me know how it goes with the BMRAs and if you need any advice or tip because, um, you know, like, like, um, it's not that I'm in marketing, but I am in media. So I, I kind of, you know, come at it from a different perspective where it's like when you make a documentary, you also have to think about selling it actually from the moment you actually start, uh, start making right. it. So I have more kind of like a, a, a media, uh, uh, background and like I do think indeed it's it's your your organization is seriously needed simply for the fact that the radical feminists have literally gone insane and sometimes that the left indulges uh, the radical feminists it, 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 it's beyond my mind so we really need a counterbalance and and a voice um, a voice for boys and men all right perfect well thank you so much and uh, I will talk to you later. Okay. Bye. So get this goddamn dog. Look at this. Look at this dog. She's lying on the back of the couch like she's a cat. Let's see. Okay. Go. 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 Beat it. Get lost. Go. Go. You're... You're infringing on my space. You're not a cat. All right.